Hey guys, this is the clickers from chapter six. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. So what I recommend is that you pause the video when a new slide comes up. And then when you've decided on an answer, then continue it because then I'll show you the answer and give you a brief explanation when uh, when that's appropriate. So let's see. Let's go from this one. So here's the first one. Hollow tube lying flat on a table. We want to know which way the ball will go when it emerges. And the answer here is option C. Basically, when the ball gets to this point, it's going that direction. So it's going to keep on going that direction because there's no force pushing it back toward the center to keep it going around in a circle anymore. So option C is the answer. Here's the next one. Uh, ball on the end of a string. And I'll come to the answer right now. Okay. Um, kind of don't like the wording of this question. Uh, the ball is accelerating because there's a force on it, but we know it is accelerating because the direction is changing. The speed is not changing, but the direction is. So that is an acceleration. Here's the next one. Ball on the end of a string again. We we'll know the direction of the acceleration of the ball. And the answer is toward the center of the circle. It's a centripetal acceleration, uh, causing acceleration toward the center of the circle as all things that are rotating uh, that is the case for all things that are rotating. Here's the next one. Uh, the force producing the centripetal acceleration of the ball. Here's the answer. It is the tension in the string. Uh, the tension in the string is the thing that is causing the ball to change direction. It's really the only significant force acting since it's in a horizontal plane. Next one here. Ball at the end of a string. Uh, the direction of the net force on the ball. Here's the answer is toward the center of the circle. If it's accelerating in a direction, then the net force also has to be in that direction. That's true for linear motion and for rotational motion. Since the acceleration is toward the center of the, the uh, circle, that means that the net force also has to be toward the center of the circle. That comes up again in a later slide here as well. Okay, here we go to the next one. Hockey puck on a string, same idea. This is a string on a, in a, a swing in a horizontal plane. And... Um, the uh, answer is the tension in the string is pulling it toward the center. I think they're actually kind of establishing a pattern here for some later ones. Here's the next one. Coin on a rotating turntable. Now, this is like an old-fashioned record player uh, that we're looking down on. It's going around and around, or like a, the floor of a merry-go-round. Maybe that's another way to look at it. The direction of the coin's velocity is A. It's going that way. Uh, okay, here's the next one. Uh, we want to know the direction of the frictional force on the coin. And uh, here's the answer. The answer is D. Now, the reason for this is because uh, the friction in this situation is playing the role of the string and with the hockey puck or the string on the end of the ball or the normal force on the outside of the hoop on the very first question where it was going around and we had to figure out which way it was going to be going uh, when, it, when it emerged from the tube. Um, the, uh, um, the frictional force has to be toward the center because that is the centripetal force causing the circular motion. All right. Uh, if the frictional force disappeared, it will go in direction A because it's just like if we cut the string then the ball is going to continue on in this direction. In this case, it's a coin. But since it's moving in this direction at this moment, if the force is removed from it, it's going to keep on going in that direction pretty much forever because that's first law. So direction A is the answer. Okay, uh, physics textbook swinging like a pendulum. We want to know which free body diagram describes it. And the answer is C. Now, the deal is... Um, First off, there does not need to be any more force to keep it going to the right. It's already moving to the right, so inertia will keep it moving to the right. Doesn't cause any extra, doesn't require any extra force. So D and E are out of the question here. Now, why is the vertical force greater than the, or the up force greater than the down force? It's because if they were equal, as in B, then the book, book would be in equilibrium and it would just go in a straight line, not going up, not going down to the right here forever and ever. But since it is actually accelerating upwards, that means there has to be a net force upwards, in this case toward the center of the circle, to cause it to follow the circular path. So that's why it is C. Okay, next one. This is kind of the same situation but upside down. A, har, a car cresting a hill. Right, and the free body diagram on it is A. So in this case, there's a net force downward, and that's why it's following a kind of a parabolic uh, 
path here where it's going up and then coming back down. It's actually circular. It's not truly parabolic. I should be precise with that. But the net force is downward because the car is accelerating downward. Now, at the moment that we've taken our snapshot, it happens to be moving directly to the right, but the trend is for it to still be going faster and faster in a downward direction. So that means that the net force has to be downward. Another way to look at it is it's following a circular path with the circle, uh, the center of the circle below the, the uh, you know, about where my cursor is right now. <clears throat> so that means that has to be the direction of the net force because that's the direction of the acceleration, centripetal acceleration. Next one. Uh, here we have a uh, roller coaster train going upside down through a loop. So, um, and this is just asking a straight free body diagram question. <clears throat> Answer here is E. So there's two forces acting. There's gravity pulling on the train car, pulling it down. That's one of the arrows. And then the train track is also pushing down on the uh, on the wheels. So that's the other one pushing down. Now, uh, the way they have it labeled here, I think is incorrect. I think that the force of gravity needs to be the lesser force and the, um, the normal force from the track pushing down has to be the greater force. Uh, if it was reversed, the, tra the, uh, the, uh, the train would not, the car would not stay on the track. There wouldn't be enough force to, uh, uh, um, well, to keep it on the track, the, the gravity would win and it would fall off. Anyway, um, all right, here's a coin on another turntable. So again, we're looking kind of down at a record player and we wanna know what force is acting uh, in the plane of the turntable. So we're uh, ignoring vertical forces and we're only dealing with the ones that are in the plane here. Anyway, answer coming. And it's this one, friction. Again, this is the same thing as before. The uh, static friction has to be uh, pointing toward the center of the turntable uh, to produce the centripetal force that keeps the thing going in a, uh, in a circular path. Um, and since that's really the only force acting on it, that's the direction of the friction. Um, centripetal force is not a type of force, it's just a direction of force. And uh, the, there is no kinetic friction because there's no relative motion between the coin and the, and the turntable. But there has to be some force because if there was no force, then the coin would just be going in a straight line. It wouldn't be following a, a circular path. Next one. Uh, this is kind of a bogus one. It's, uh, it turns out to be uh, C here. And you have to pay attention to what... Uh, direction R is. So it's, I don't know, it's kind of a rinky-dink question. We'll move on. A uh, free body diagram for a car going around a, a banked turn. Um, and yeah, this is, think of this strictly as free body diagram. Okay. Here's the answer. It is this one. So I'm going to go back to the previous one to show, but okay. Gravity always acts straight down. So that is the downward component here. Normal force is always perpendicular to the surface surface that produces it. So that's this one here. And friction is always parallel to the surface that, that is encountering it. So it has to be aligned with the, uh, with the, the tilted uh, road here. Now, when we put them all together and add them all together, we get a net force, which is going straight sideways toward the center of the circle. So the sum of all of those forces is a centripetal force that keeps it going toward the center of the circle. Okay, force on planet Y on planet X is how what uh, portion of the magnitude of X on Y? So Y pulls on X. How much force does X pull on Y? Hopefully you recognize this as a third law question. Um, if one object is exerting a force on another object, the other object is exerting the same force on the original object. Always, always, you will see this question on your AP exam. Probably won't look like this, but it will be there. Okay, now this is more about gravity. So this is an application, hint, hint, this is an application of the uh, inverse square relationship. So we are doubling the distance between the two asteroids, and we want to know what happens to the force of gravity between them. For this one, you want to use Newton's uh, law of gravity. Force of gravity equals big G times M1 times M2, whole thing divided by R squared. It's on the AP gauge. That's one you use. Answer is 250,000 newtons, one quarter of the force. Double the distance, keep everything else the same. If you double the distance, you'll get one quarter of the force. If you triple the distance, you'll get one ninth the force. If you make it five times the distance, you'll get 
excuse me, 1 25th the force. Inverse square function. Here's the next one. Now we're changing two things. So we're doubling the mass of one of them, and we are also doubling the radius. So the easiest way to do this, uh, I mean, you can do it with pen and paper, and that works well, uh, but you can also treat them just as uh, figuring out the difference that one change makes and the difference the other change makes, and then put them together. Comes out to be four meters per second, which is one half the, uh, the force. Okay, so doubling the mass will double the force. Doubling the distance between them will cut the force in one quarter. So two times one quarter is one half the original acceleration or force. And so you wind up with uh, option B. Okay, why do uh, astronauts in the space station, uh, why are they weightless? weightless? Here's the answer right now. There it is, because they're in free fall. Okay, please, please don't make the mistake that there's no gravity in outer space or that it is very, very small. It's actually very close to the surface of the Earth, so it's over 90% of what it is here on the surface, but they're just in free fall. So please, please remember that one. Um, let's see. And two satellites in circular orbits with the same radius, which has the higher speed. Here we come to the answer. Right? They both have the same speed, and this is because all objects fall at the same rate. A bowling ball and a baseball with different masses fall at the same rate. So it doesn't matter if one has more uh, mass than the other. They are experiencing the same gravitational field, so they're going to accelerate the same way. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Two identical satellites have different circular orbits, which has a higher speed. Okay, the one in the higher orbit or the one in the lower orbit. Here's the answer. Here's the one in the lower orbit. Uh, because it has more gravity, so it's the it's going to experience a higher acceleration. So it's going to uh, accelerate around the uh, the Earth more quickly, and it's just going to have to go faster so it can keep on missing the Earth. Uh, as you know, an object in orbit is uh, um, is falling; it's just going sideways so fast that it keeps on missing. Uh, and since the force on it is high, it's going to fall pretty fast. So it has to be going fast to keep missing the Earth. So smaller orbit uh, has a higher speed. Another way to look at this is that uh, the one in the higher orbit um, has been thrown higher, so it's going slower. And then as it starts falling back down again, it goes faster and faster. So when it descends to a lower orbit, it will be going faster. That's another way to look at it. And if it somehow rises to a higher orbit, it will be slowing down up there. Okay, let's see. 60 kilogram person stands on uh, a variety of planets. We want to know where their weight is greatest. And here's the answer. There it is. Uh, the reason is because uh, the mass and the radius are increasing at the same rate. But inverse square law comes into play for the increase in radius, but not for the increase in mass. So, for example, in this one, twice the mass, that's me twice the gravity, but twice the radius is one quarter the gravity. So the, the difference in radius is going to have a larger effect than the difference in mass. For this one, three times the mass is three times the gravity, but three times the radius is one-ninth the force. So um, that's why it's the small one in this case. All right, finally, satellite orbits the Earth. Uh, space shuttle crew sent to boost the satellite to a higher orbit. Which quantity increases? Let you think that one through. And here is the answer. And the answer is the period. And you may not be familiar with this term. We did show up once, but we kind of went over it kind of quickly. Period is how long it takes to go around. Okay. It's just going to take uh, more time to complete an orbit when it's in a higher, uh, uh, in, when it's higher up. So the speed's going to be slower because higher speeds are slower. The angular speed is going to be slower because it takes longer to go around. So the, you know, like the, how quickly the minute hand or how quickly the second hand is going, it's going to be slowing down. Centripetal acceleration is less because, again, the direction is changing at a lower rate because it takes longer to go all the way around. And gravity is weaker when you get higher up, so that's not it either. So the period is just going to take longer to go around. So even if you didn't know that term, you might have been able to get there by process of elimination. Okay, and that's it. So that's the one for Chapter 6. Let's see, that's enough for that one. I'll do another one for Chapter 7. So see you soon.